Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Dave Kong. I'm a professor in the School of International Relations and the Marshall School of Business uh, here at USC. And I also direct the Korean Studies Institute ta -da, and uh, the East Asian Studies Center. And we've been doing these talks for a while uh, about North Korea. And what we're going to do is two, hopefully, 40-minute talks. As I said, the first one will be an overview of North Korea. The second one will be much more specifically about the nuclear and missile crisis. And we'll take a break in the middle. Uh, so one of the, one of the interesting things about North Korea is, uh, well, OK, so here's what we're going to do. We'll describe it. We'll talk about the North Korean people. Talk about the uh, uh, Confucian North Korea, whatever that means. And then we'll talk about the economy. Because one of, and one of the reasons that I've done this, I don't actually uh, do that much about the nuclear crisis anymore. I don't write that much about it. Um, and you'll find out why in the next lecture, because basically I'm bored. We're having the same debates we were having 20 years ago about what to do about North Korea. Hit them with a stick. Give them a carrot. Right? Uh, and we're literally having the same debates we were. What I find actually in many ways more interesting, and even when I'm invited to do a talk only about the nuclear issue, I always start out with something like this, because we do it really, really badly. We don't have any idea what North Korea is like. And so what we're going to do is talk about it a little bit, right? And I'm going to start with a picture of Detroit. Detroit's beautiful, horrible decline. And I guarantee we could do the same thing about LA or any city which is if we want to portray it in a good light, we can portray it in a good light. We can only show pictures of Beverly Hills or USC, right? Or we could show the worst side. We could show a crumbling Detroit here, and we could portray it in a way that would make nobody ever want to come to LA or Detroit or something like that. And what happens, particularly with North Korea, is that we are engaged in a, I don't want to call it a debate, but a, a contest, Everyone is trying to describe North Korea. North Korea is trying to present a face that they want us to see. Activists present one side. Uh, other people present another side. Everybody's trying to describe North Korea to other audiences. And it's important to remember that it's really easy to get sucked into seeing one picture and realizing and thinking that that's the reality for everything. Now, this is particularly the case with North Korea. Whoops, because... Uh, it's very easy, and we have a bunch of stereotypes about North Korea. They're brainwashed robots. They're a bunch of automatons. They don't think for themselves. At the same time, uh, the 55-minute freakout, unpredictable, inscrutable. We have another uh, uh, image of North Korea, which is either they're brainwashed robots, or every single one of them is groaning every day and wishes they could leave. Now, both of those are actually incompatible <laughs> with each other. right? But we have a bunch of caricatures of North Korea, of stereotypes. And it's actually even worse than that, right? North Korea is not only a stereotype, it's a joke. So what would we do? We laugh at North Koreans. So here, what they did is they took a picture of the North Korean army uh, marching, and they put it to like some disco music or something, and they did the whole cha 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 kind of thing. So you can Google this, and I refuse to show you because I'm not going to just, uh, you know, legitimate it. But what we do is we can take and we can laugh at North Koreans. What's this? Uh, many of you remember that great 80s hit, Take On Me by AHA. Evidently, some Norwegian or somebody went to North Korea, played for some kids this song, and they came back a couple days later, and the kids had figured out how to play it on accordions. It's actually, they did an amazing job playing the song. But that's not up there because it's amazing. It's up there so that we can laugh at them. Ah, how weird, how strange. They're playing AHA on accordions. So we laugh at them. They're either not humans or they're a joke. Now I'll admit, this is funny. <laughs> Who's this? Kim Jong-il. You can laugh. I laugh. The Economist is great, right? This is the former leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, after he had a meeting in 2000 with the South Korean leader, the first meeting ever between North and South Korea. Take me to your leader. Um, but they're easy, and frankly, he doesn't help himself. It's easy to make jokes about the guy, right? Uh, but what I'm going to do is try and actually move beyond some of these stereotypes and try and think about what does North Korea actually look like. So the first thing is, how big is it? The distance between the capital of Pyongyang and Seoul, the capital of South Korea and North Korea, about 160 kilometers. 
here to San Diego. You should be able to drive in two hours between the two countries. In between, of course, is the demilitarized zone, which we will talk about in more detail uh, in the second hour. And that's actually uh, the biggest uh, uh, misnomer in world geography, right? It's the most militarized border in the world. It's the most heavily guarded border in the world. It's not demilitarized at all. There are more tanks and guns and people nose to nose there than in any other place on the planet. So, now we have a little quiz. Don't feel bad if you don't get this right. Uh, what's the size in terms of the economy of the U United States economy, the GDP? And don't worry if you don't know, because you know, I teach MBAs, they don't know. They know their own bank account, but they don't know the size of the American economy, right? What's, what's the size of the American economy, anybody? Somebody guess. A hundred. No. no? Fifteen trillion dollars about. The size of the next largest economy is Japan. Anybody take a wild guess? I'll give you a hint, it's lower than 15, billion, 15 trillion. Meredith, no? Well, I'm leaving China out because it's a big debate about how to measure China. China is clearly sort of number two or three. We're pretty sure what Japan is. About six trillion dollars. About a third the size of the United States is the second largest country in the world. South Korea? Anybody? Anybody here from South Korea? You should know, young man. No, right? <laughs> I don't know why you should know. Around 1.5, 1.5 1 trillion dollars. What's the size of North Korea's economy? And you'll see why I did it in 1,000 billion. <laughs> it is close to 100, yes? Uh, it's, that's too complicated. It's, it's one measure. It's the rough measure that we use, right? Um, about $40 billion, right? North Korea's economy is tiny compared to South Korea or the United States. It's tiny. That doesn't mean it's not dangerous. That doesn't mean it can't do bad things. But it does mean we just want to keep in context how small North Korea is compared to South Korea, compared to the United States. One more thing. Uh, population, about 25 million, 24 million. North Korea, South Korea, about double that. Japan, double that. U.S., double that. 25 million people, uh, $40 billion economy. Just to get a picture, right? And now I'm going to do, if there's only one thing you remember from today, I want you to remember this section. Because I titled this section, the, this whole lecture, right, They Think They're Normal. And the reason I titled it that is it's really easy for us to create characters about North Korea. And it's also very easy as, for us to forget that the North Korean people are the most direct victims of the dictatorial rule. Not you, not me. The people who live there are the most direct victims. And you know what? They didn't ask to be born there. They did not choose to be born in North Korea. But like you and like me, that's where they grew up. That's where they're born, they grow up, they get married, take a job, fight with their wife, she does not look very happy, right? They don't think they're abnormal. They think they're normal. This is their world. This is where they went to school. Whoops. This is where they went to school. This is where they grew up. This is where their friends live. Why does it keep doing this? There we go, right? Kiyopta, uh, right? They are. They don't know that they're born in a tyrannical North Korea. They don't have any idea. These kids don't have any idea. A lot of these pictures are taken by a friend of mine. Right? If you're on Wonsan on the East Sea, you're not in the capital city. You're not in the most impoverished regions, which are to the far north. It's not a great life. It's not a horrible life. It just is life. And in the summertime, they hang out in the, on, the, on the beach like anybody else. And like anybody else, when kids see a camera, they go running towards it. And it's very easy to forget. I like this picture. 
you rarely see photos of a North Korean soldier smiling. But I'll bet they tell jokes. Usually grim jokes. <laughs> Actually, one of our postdocs, Sandra Fahi, has done extensive research with refugees. And one of the interesting things that everybody who studies trauma or mass genocide finds is that they do tell jokes. They find ways to interpret their own reality in ways that make sense and that make fun of, in indirect ways, the reality that they live in. They don't walk around every day worrying about what's going on with the regime any more than we walk around every day worrying about what's going on in the fiscal cliff or something like that. Most of them get up and go to their job, try and make it through the day. Girl studying. These are my, uh, some of my favorite photos. As you'll see, North Korea is very traditional. And one of the ways that I say to think about North Korea is it's extremely Korean. Many things have not changed in the last hundred years. They're still pushing things around with uh, carts. Now, this is actually my favorite photo. What's that? Does anybody know? Pretty obvious. It's ice skating, right? What do they do in the wintertime in the far north? Take a block of wood and uh, two sticks in lieu of ice skates. When I saw that photo, I almost fell over because my father was born in uh, Pyongyangbukdo in northern Korea in the 1930s. And when he was growing up, he used to tell me stories, oh, this is our house, blah, blah, blah. And he said, one of the funny things, ha, 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 in the olden days when we had no money, we would take a block of wood and two sticks. I was like, no. And he drew me a picture of what it looked like. I saw this 70, 80 years later, they're doing the same thing. And I happened to be home a couple years ago and I found the picture he drew. Right? North Korea became Christian much more than the South much earlier than the South. It's very interesting. I have some stories about that which we'll get to later, right? Things have not changed in uh, 70 years. Pyongyang is a real city. It's not a bunch of mud huts or you know, shattered, burned out buildings. Now the story that I'm telling you here is about the majority of them. If you think about true, whoops, if you think about true collaborators, come on. If you think about true collaborators who are truly running the regime in a repressive way, how many is that maybe? 100,000, a million, who are truly at the top? Because if you're a mid-level colonel or you're working in the bureaucracy somewhere, you're not the one who's making decisions, you're trying to get through. Who's truly in the ruling elite that is, that is collaborators who are keeping everyone down? Maybe a million people. How many people do we estimate at the outside are in prison camps? Anybody? 200,000, 100 to 200,000 are actually in prison camps, million, a couple million along the north. So that means 20, 20 million people aren't either the top or the bottom. And like anybody else, they're trying to get through the day. And it's, it's important to remember, what I find disappointing about the way that our, uh, our discussion about North Korea goes, the way that the dialogue in the United States goes is, that I have to say the following thing, which is the fact that I'm pointing out the basic humanity of North Korean people does not mean I am supporting the regime or defending the regime. It makes me sad that I have to say this. They're different. They are the biggest victims of what's going on in North Korea. And it's easy for us to forget that. So let me try and explain a little bit more about why it hasn't, survived, why it hasn't collapsed. Most of the other con uh, communist countries have collapsed uh, uh, from Cuba. Well, Cuba's still hanging on, right? But almost all of them have reformed significantly. North Korea is really clinging to a, what we think of as a communist system. But I don't think we should think of it that way. I think we should think of it as a Confucian system. So this is the uh, standard s symbol of the uh, Communist Party. What is that? Somebody raise a hand. I think I heard it. Hammer and sickle. Did somebody say that? Right. What does the hammer stand for? The workers. The sickle stands for the peasants, you know, you know, proletariat, right? What's interesting about the North Korean uh, Communist Party logo? Raise your hand, don't shout it out. What's interesting about it? Yes. Whoops. You know this already. Is it a paintbrush? What kind of paintbrush? 
Okay, that's usually what they serve out was a candle, right? It looks like a candle. It's not a candle, it's a paintbrush. What kind of paintbrush? A little more specific. I heard someone raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. A Confucian scholar's brush. Come on. That one. There we go. Right. Now this is odd. This is really odd. Communism everywhere stands for sweeping away everything from the past. And yet, there's probably not a more traditional symbol of traditional Korea than Confucian scholars' brush that they use to take the state civil service exam system, where they used to show off to each other by painting poems. Right? This is a very different image that the North Korean leadership is telling its people. They're saying, we're Korean. Oops. Now, what's interesting about this picture of North Korean women? How do you act like a woman in a communist country, right? What's interesting about this? Raise your hand. Somebody? Uh, Ji Hyun. She's wearing a hanbok, or we wouldn't call that North Korea. We'd call it Joseonot. <laughs> right, same thing, right? It's, she's wearing a traditional Korean dress. But she's a revolutionary fighting against the evil, actually, it's probably the evil Japanese, but in any case, right? This is how we think of, of revolutionary women. They don't wear the traditional stuff. That's a sign of feudalism and backwardness. So in China, you'd never see any iconography that has uh, uh, whatever they call it, jipao, right? They're all wearing the uh, modified Mao suit or something. But in Korea, North Korea, you're far more likely to see women wearing hanbok or chosonot than you are in South Korea. That's the uh, lapel pin of Kim Il-sung, which many people, most people wear, the founding leader of North Korea. Again, it's an odd type of story if you look at it with a communist lens. But it is clearly a story that links back to and makes sense to Koreans as to who they are and what they stand for. The final one... It's often common to say the first communist monarchy, the first communist dynasty, which again is a total misnomer because anybody who knows Korean society knows that the basic building block of Korean society is the family unit. So, for example, here's Kim Il-sung, the leader, Kim Jong-il, his son is running, grandson is running it now. Uh, we can go to Samsung. Whoops, where's the picture? I didn't get it updated. Uh, his, his son, uh, the grandson, is now the vice chairman. Right? And you can do this with almost all Korean jebol. Koreans know up until about 10 years ago, if you were from the same family clan, you could not marry each other. It's only odd if you don't know Korea. If you know Korea, it makes perfect sense. Korea is run by a family building unit. That's how society is organized. So what is, what is the North Korean leadership telling its people? They're telling themselves, we're the true Koreans. We haven't sold out the way those South Koreans did just to get rich. We're the real Koreans. We're defending what it means to be Korea. We're not giving in to Westerners. We're not being corrupted by money. And if that requires a little sacrifice, that's fine. We're happy to do it. Now, clearly this is propaganda. But one of the reasons that North Korea hasn't cracked and crumbled is it's propaganda that resonates. It's a story that resonates. And in fact, there's many things that both North and South Korea agree on. For example, that those Dokdo Islands are Korean. <laughs> they can both agree. We hate the Japanese. Right? I mean, there's many things. Nationalism didn't stop in 1945. North Korea and South Korea are telling different stories about who's the real Koreans. And in many ways, North Korea is the more traditional country. And again, this, many of the stories are when North Korean refugees come south, one of the reasons they have a hard time is this isn't the Korea they expected. It's a very different Korea. South Korea is globalized. It's modern. Everybody's running around. Everybody's using banmal, right? It's horrifying, horrifying, I tell you. If you know, anyway, you know, everyone's speaking very rudely, right? So I'm not saying it's right ideology, I'm not saying it's okay, but it is obvious. The regime is not hiding what they're telling their people. It's right out there. We are the Koreans, and here's what it means to be Korean. And it works, right? So um, 
let's talk a little bit about business, and then we'll, hopefully there'll be enough time for some questions, right? Uh, one of the things about uh, uh, the economy, business, is that the central regime has lost a lot of control. And there are changes I didn't think I would see that have already come about. I sort of gave it away because of the bad remote. Um, who's this? Bart, right. Here's the lapel pin, and here's an Adidas hat. I'm not sure about this, but it's probably a knockoff. Um, and of course, who doesn't love crabinated drink? So refreshing. <laughs> now, what, what bums me out about this is, uh, in, the, in the 1980s, when I was in Korea as a kid, uh, there was only one brewery, and it was called uh, Oriental Brewery, OB. And I had this t-shirt that I wore around proudly, and I obviously disintegrated 20 years ago, right? Uh, but it said, OB Large Beer. Right? Because, of course, it should have said Lager Beer. And a Korean who knew just enough English was like, wait, there's a, mis there's a typo. I'm so proud of me. There's a typo. And they made it large beer, right? So I had this T-shirt, OB large beer, right? Um, that's what happens, right? It's not quite as, you know, South Korea wasn't always as uh, globalized as it was, right? Um, interestingly enough, a buddy of mine took these last summer. Um, and the one policy point that you should take away from this, the sanctions are not working. Heineken... Uh, choco pie, uh, a, a delicious uh, cookie, I guess, right? Uh, and, of course, there's Disney, which is one of the things that bugged me when everyone went nuts about uh, what's-his-name going to, and seeing Disney characters, uh, Kim Jong-un about six months ago seeing Disney characters, right? And I got all these calls from reporters saying, ha, 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 isn't this so funny? It's like, if anybody knew anything about North Korea, it's not a surprise, it's only a surprise to people who haven't been paying attention and who only listen to the, they're all brainwashed, we're all idiots. Anybody who's been watching knows that this stuff has been infiltrating for a long time. Oops. Uh, DHL, you can send the letter DHL. It's all legal, I've been assured. Right? They set up an offshore subsidiary in... I don't know. You know, I don't know, how the, I don't know how the legal go, right? But you can send DHL. I was talking to the guy who runs it. Uh, this summer, and I said, I asked, actually asked him for a better picture, and he said, that's the best one we have, right? Um, but I said, how is it going? Because what happens is DHL air freight, you go, you, it goes through Beijing, and then Beijing sends it on to, to Pyongyang. So you can literally send a DHL letter from here, and it'll get to uh, Pyongyang, if you want to write to Kim Jong-un, okay? Merry Christmas, um, right? So I asked him, I said, What's, how's it going? And he said, actually, we're losing, we're losing uh, volume. And I said, oh, no, the economy's doing really poorly, huh? He said, actually, no, the economy's doing a lot better. Chinese trucking is eating all of our uh, 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 volume because Chinese trucking is a lot cheaper and a lot more straightforward than air freight, right? There's a lot of changes going on on the China-North Korea border. There's a lot more interchange going on. Uh, some of the other things happening... Uh, some fashions that I never thought I'd see, again, taken last summer... Like, girls, the girls here look, you know, is the Kim Jong-il high heels, uh, but, you know, look as fashionable as uh, the girls in Seoul in some ways, right? The, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un's wife comes out looking all, all well-dressed. Uh, cell phones. There's over a million cell phones in use in North Korea. Now, clearly, to use cell phones, you have to be in the relative elite, Got to have enough money and access and things like that. It's obviously clearly censored. But the interesting thing, it's run by an Egyptian company called Orozcom. Uh, and I had a, a chat with one of the guys who runs it. I said, they put $400 million into building cell towers in North Korea. So I said to him, aren't you worried about losing your money? I mean, it's Kim Jong-un, right? And, and he said, actually, Northeast Asia is by far the most vibrant uh, economic center in the world. The only place in, North in, in Northeast Asia that is not built up is North Korea. So this is a strategic bet on our part. Because if we get in first, we're going to make billions of dollars. And if we lose it, we lose it. We're not trying to lose it. But it is a strategic bet that over time, North Korea is going to open up and will be there first. And the numbers have just skyrocketed in the last couple of years since they've, since they've put in uh, cell phones. Right? Also... Uh, there's a lot more computer stuff going on. You all, you all may remember Google. 
uh, what's his name, Eric Schmidt went just a week or two ago, right? Whether or not anything happened, I have no idea, but North Korea does have more uh, computers, flat screens, uh, HPs, etc., than we think. So again, uh, in fact, there's, there's been talk of some European companies of trying to outsource some of their programming to North Korea, uh, rather than, like, say, to India or some of the other places that tend to do a lot of the coding, uh, because they tend to be pretty good. And the point of showing you all this is that in many ways, although the, the missile and the security situation hasn't changed at all, the economic and social situation has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. There's still enormous repression. There's still enormous types of control. It's nowhere near an open market the way we would think about a, uh, even a Chinese type of reforms. But compared to, say, 2001, 2002, there's far more information coming over the border. There's far more trade. One of the things that happened is uh, about 10 years ago, if you were a North Korean and you were a trader and you wanted to go out to China and smuggle things back in, the guards would try and arrest you. They arrested everybody at the border. But what they realized, and they still arrest all the refugees, because they view them as the worst type of trader that's trying to leave the country. So they will do everything they can to get refugees back. But they also know that if you're a trader and you're going out and you're coming back, they realize that to arrest you is to kill the golden goose, the, go the goose that lays the golden eggs. And rather than arrest you, if you're going to go out and they, they're, they're sure you're going to come back, they just take a bribe, 15 20%. And then you keep going, and every time you go, 15 20%. The border guard's human security is better off by taking those bribes. He's able to then provide for his family. He can then bribe the local officials to stay off his back. And so human security for the local officials in the border regions improves with a gray market or a black market. And so the traders now basically can walk unhindered back and forth. And one example of that is a couple years ago, a friend of mine who does a lot of research on the North Korea-China border said, uh, a couple years ago, if you wanted to send money from South Korea to uh, relatives or family in North Korea, it would take a couple months because you would have to talk to this courier who would physically go to China, and then they would go across the border. And he said, now you can do it in about a day because there are guys in North Korea who are sort of walking ATMs. They've got cell phones, they call, you know, so they just make a series of phone calls now and somebody can get the money to your family. Control has not been lost by any stretch of the imagination, but it is far looser than it was 10 years ago. And that's one reason the regime is trying to do things to, to keep uh, control. Right? So, you know, again, the point I'd leave you with, North Korea is a real country with real people. Some are in living in horrific conditions. And some are in danger of starving today. Many are not in danger of starving. They're trying to get through their lives the same way we're trying to get through our lives. And one of the reasons I think we misunderstand North Korea so often is we rarely talk to real North Koreans. <laughs> we prefer to just live by the caricatures that are comforting and make sense to us. Right? Um, so who's this guy? Kim Jong-un. We all know him, right? Now, uh, this may be a little inappropriate, but uh, the joke that went around, uh, this is how little we tend to know, though, about the ruling regime, right? Until two years ago, we had no photographs of him. This photograph was taken in September 2010 when he was officially anointed uh, as the great successor, the young general, Gui Jung Han Doryeon Nim, right? Um, we had no pictures. Two, we, we still don't know how old he is. But, uh, and this may be inappropriate, but I can't resist. Uh, the joke that went around when we first saw the pictures of him? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I know. I, I, I can't. I, I think it's funny, right? Uh, but, right? What's going to happen with him? We don't know. The intense, uh, literally every couple months I get asked, you know, for, by some newspaper or TV, like, what's, what's going on now? What's happening? I'm like, we don't know. We're still trying to figure it out, right? Is he going to reform? Is he not going to reform? Does the fact that he has a pretty young wife who's out there mean that he's going to try and change it, or is this just all PR and propaganda, right? He has said things that are very different. He said to his people last summer, North Koreans should never go hungry. 
which before the story was always, if you have to go hungry for the country, that's a price worth paying. It's a very different story that he's telling people today. It's a radically different story than his father said, which is, the Americans are causing you to be hungry. He's saying no one should go hungry. His New Year's address of a couple weeks ago was, we should have an industrial revolution, science and technology. Now, again, it's hard to tell whether he means it or not. Because everyone tends to predict that the more North Korea opens up, the weaker the regime will become. I tend not to buy that so obviously, because there's plenty of regimes that have survived a long time being far more open, China being one of them. And in fact, what China does with Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un is every time they get him in China, they shove him in front of a factory and they say, look, you too can be a dictator with economic reform. Right? So I don't know, it's, far more, it's gonna be far more fraught than simply if they open up, the regime cr crumbles. But we have a new leader. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Right? Um, and like I said, don't forget, They didn't choose to live there. Maybe we can't help all of them, maybe help one of them, right? But they're real people, they're human beings, and it's really easy to forget that and just create a caricature or a, a gross stereotype. So I will stop here on the, on the first one and we can take uh, some questions. And I think, uh, I'll leave that up for a while. Uh, Joanne and Sunakshi have some mics. Do we have any questions? Uh, the young man here. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm a uh, rescue team intern with the Liberty North Korea. And one of the questions I want to ask you, I've asked uh, one of our staff before, are in regards to China and their, um, and their booming economy, so on and so forth, do you think that that may influence the Chinese um, population to kind of expose themselves more to um, the, the ideals of the West, which would kind of influence them to speak to their government to have a different stance on, the, yeah. on, on, their, um, on their relationship with the, with the Chinese refugees who yeah. cross into China and how they handle them as refugees or the economic uh, migrants. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, how, how will China, you know, is, as Chinese get richer, are they going to demand more freedoms both for themselves or for dealing with the North Koreans? Um, on the one hand, probably at some point, right? But the problem with, particularly with, with North Korean refugees is they are competing for jobs, they are competing for resources, and that usually migrants, whether they're economic or political, tend not to be that welcomed into other countries, just whether it's frankly, we're building a great wall of our own right here you know, uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border, precisely for that reason. Um, big debate in the U.S. about immigration. Big, there's big debate in China about what to deal with them, right? Um, frankly, there's a big debate in Japan and South Korea about how many uh, immigrants to have in. So, I, I, you know, I think there is a humanitarian element, uh, but I don't tend to think that that's going to be a dominant one. I think they tend to view it more economically. Are they taking resources or my job? Right? Which is why there's so many tensions. Uh, how about, uh, yes. About, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's about um, something that I read, because you said that it's not like a monarchy, uh, North Korea. Um, I was reading in this book, and the, the information might have been wrong, but um, they were talking about how uh, King Kim, Kim Jong-il and, um, like, you know, the history they teach about him and everything, it's basically the Bible but they've changed everything yes, it's around. Yeah, geography, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they worship him yes. as a god. Yes, And so because of that, and because of the huge class differences between the people who are considered communist, like it's like yeah. a honor, and the people who are considered yes. like Chinese immigrants yeah. and stuff, like is it really a communist society anymore? No, I mean, that's, that's actually a good point. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, one of the reasons that I emphasize the, the, the Confucian side is precisely because it's too easy to just say, oh, it's a monarchy, and to miss the deep Korean roots from which that comes. You know, that being said, there's an enormous cult of personality around, around the Kim family. Right? And they've made it so that he wasn't born in this crappy little house, he was born on Baek Dusan, you know, and these kind of things, right? Came from the clouds, blah, blah, blah. There's enormous hagiography hey there. Uh, 
And there's an enormous class difference, right? Uh, maybe a better way to put it is a lot of Korean society is like a monarchy. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, you know, there's a reason we call it. Anyway, um, right? That, that often uh, uh, Korea is family-based, lineage-based, et cetera. And North Koreans are taking that to an extreme because what they have done in many ways, and if I do the, just the culture side, like what I do for my students, I'll take a day and talk just about culture. What they've done is they've basically replaced Kim Il-sung at first as the head of the family. And they have made North Korea an entire family. So there's photos or, or paintings where Kim, Kim Il-sung is comforting the mother as the children play. And the father's nowhere to be. The, Kim Il-sung takes the father's role. And the father's just off somewhere. So they have grafted him onto a family unit and onto the nation in a way that's a, this sort of mix of Korean Confucianism and then this, this ardent nationalism. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question. I know when the Middle East starts to fall to dem democratic regimes, there was a huge talk about North Korea actually, you know, having this hope to actually become a democratic regime as well. Um, I know South Korean uh, reporters were saying, you know, their, their soldiers were throwing in, you know, these little pamphlets trying to tell them about the good news about, you know, democracy and Western, uh, Western ideals. What do you believe is, you know, do you believe that a demo democratic regime would work for North Korea, or do you believe it's just kind of like China, where sometimes a communist party works for you know these these type of countries? Because yeah. um, in my opinion, I believe that a country like North Korea has been so rooted in Confucian ideas as well as communist ideas. If you just kind of throw upon democracy upon them, I feel like it will kind of set back you know like you said some of the reforms that are going on right now or some of the industrial revolutions that are going on right now. Yeah. I mean. I guess the question, that, well, there's two questions. One is, like, how would you get there, right? It, would a transformation in North Korea be bottom-up, or does it have to be top-down, right? Is there going to be an Arab Spring in North Korea? And I think very few of us who look at North Korea closely think that'll happen. Not only is there way too much repression, uh, not only is there a fair amount of legitimacy, not only are they divided up so hard. I mean, one of the things that happened in the Middle East is there were local groups that were uh, able to organize and rally support. In North Korea is a genuinely totalitarian state. Do you know what the definition of a totalitarian state is versus authoritarian? Does anybody know the difference? Authoritarian, totalitarian. The basic idea, authoritarian means no political freedoms. But you can do a bunch of other stuff. They don't really care, right? Totalitarian, nothing exists outside of the institutions of the state. So for example, in North Korea, there is no independent soccer team, right? The soccer team is the army team, or the internal police team, or the factory team, right? There is no church other than the state-sanctioned church. Nothing exists. You don't form your own company. You don't form a group. You don't form a university. Everything is, is a, a, an arm of the state, right? And in many ways, what we think is that while maybe there might be some bottom-up rebellion in North Korea, uh, it's extremely hard to get organized. If you're hungry and you don't like what's going on in the government it's, and you can't talk to anybody else and form a group, how are you going to go then, let's all meet at 5 o'clock and do this, right? So we tend to think it's going to be a top-down fissure, a palace coup or something that'll make the regime collapse, and then hard to tell what will happen, right? So it's, you know, in that sense, I don't think a democracy is going to sort of well up spontaneously. You know, and the question is, if there's some kind of regime, one thing we're doing next week in, in Seoul is we're having a, the third year of a research project we've been doing on what happens after problems after unification. What are the inevitable things you've got to deal with after unification? Not whether unification will occur, but how do you fix the public health system? How do you fix the education system? How do you have transitional justice? with a South Korea that is still finding Japanese collaborators and punishing them 70 years later, right? What's going to happen in North Korea if the first thing we do is find the collaborators and punish them, right? Bloodshed, right? So a lot of things about that. And one, of course, how do you institute uh, uh, political institutions that function without just keeping all the old regime in there? I mean, it's not an easy question. How's that for a non-answer? How about one more? Or are we... Uh, have I pummeled you? Yes, last one, and then we'll take a break. Um, as someone who, is, I'm on the IR side of the thing, so a lot of this information was new for me. Um, how do Koreans see each other? Like, 
how do people in South Korea view North Koreans and vice versa? That's a great question. Uh, they used to see each other, I think, a lot more brotherly. There still is a view in South Korea. I mean, this is the interesting thing, right? The typical way that they will talk about South Korean views of North Korea today are, especially the younger generation, doesn't want unification. Oh, they're really so different from us. They're bumpkins. There's always been a regional divide in Korea, where if you had a strong North Korean pyeon uh, saturi, a North Korean accent like my dad, you were considered uneducated, a bumpkin. Now this gap is even more. The North Koreans come down, they have a really hard time fitting in in South Korea. So there's sort of South Koreans are now saying, wait a minute, we're not as close as I thought we were. But at the same time, I wouldn't push that too far. Because if you ask any South Korean, what is Korea? They don't say it stops at the DMZ. It's unquestioned that Korea goes to the Yalu River. It's unquestioned that's what Korea is. Right? And the evidence for that, for those of you who know, there's this kingdom called Goguryeo. How many of you think Goguryeo is Korean? <laughs> Right? If you truly don't think North Koreans are Koreans, then you could care less about Kogoda, which is way up there. Right? Clearly, people do. This is what Korea is. And there's a belief in Korea that, you know, in some ways, we should try and manage the problem rather than simply just punish them. So I think it's a, it's a complex view, but I think there is elements that say they, they really are part of us, and yet there's an element which is like they're the, you know, they're the crazy uncle that we don't want to have come to Thanksgiving too often. Right? Um, that's the, the quick answer. Um, good. Why don't we take about a 10-minute break, and at 4 o'clock, I'll start the, the security uh, lecture. Thanks so much, everybody.